Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. I, and just watching your faces saying, you know, I really don't know this guy who's going to speak to you. Just watching some of your faces like, you know, <laughs> it's not necessarily the best thing to, to lead with. You know, I really don't know who's going to fill my pulpit, really. But I, I just sense the Lord uh, is, is saying he's a good guy. So let me, let me tell you a little bit about uh, what I thought about this. One thing I said was, are you sure you want me to come and speak? Because uh, I have nothing to do with Olive Baptist Church. I mean, uh, normally for homecomings, you invite a, a former pastor or something to speak. But you know what? I, I began to think and to pray. And, and, and after the invitation, I thought, you know what? You are my brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. And I am so very grateful to come and to be with you this morning, what a wonderful word and song, amen. I tell you what, if I do take selfies after the service, I want you to photobomb every one of them. <laughs> because you, the joy of the Lord must be your strength, brother. I've never seen more sweeter spirit and, and presence. Uh, and so I do, I want you to photobomb every, every picture. Uh, it's good to be with you. Greetings on behalf of Locust Grove Baptist Church, a.k.a. the Corn Maze Church. It's funny, I can't go anywhere in Murray now after these last seven years to, to, to order something or to get something. And, and that if I don't mention the church, that they say, you're the, you're the pastor of the Corn Maze Church. So we're known in Murray, Kentucky as the Corn Maze Church, but it's good to be known by something, right? We have hundreds of people to go through that every year, so the Lord gives us a great opportunity to minister to our community that way and to meet new people. And so it's just a joy to be able to do that. Thank you, pastor, for the invite. Uh, what, a, what a sweet pastor you have. I haven't known him very, very uh, long, but I have been getting to know him through the association, and it's just a joy to see what the Lord's doing through you and through this body here. I want to bring to you a message, Homecoming, Doors of Destiny. Homecoming, Doors of Destiny. If you'll turn to Revelation chapter 3, I know what you think. You hear that word destiny, and everybody begins to cringe. You know, what does that word really mean? Well, the textbook definition of destiny is the events that will necessarily happen to a particular person or thing in the future. Or the power that changes a person's future. So it really is your future. Now sure, I know that there are a lot of people in the world system that says the best way to, to, to figure out what your destiny is is to, to read some self-help books, maybe to watch some talk shows on TV, maybe uh, enter into the occult realm and to go uh, visit someone who can read your, uh, your uh, tarot cards or, or read your future. But I'm just dumb enough to believe that the one who created time, that the one who is outside of space and time, is the best person to go, through, go to for the destiny, my individual destiny, and the destiny for our churches as well. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. I've had my destiny shaped by a few different churches growing up. Started off as a young boy at Old Bethel Baptist Church in, on the Tennessee-Kentucky state line. As a child running up and down the pews, remember laying on my mom's shoulder and, or my grandmother's shoulder and hearing the sweet words of the hymns of the faith. I remember also Hazel Baptist Church as a teenager, Hazel, the, really the town I grew up in, the antique capital of the world. Hazel Baptist as a teenager realizing, uh, coming to a point and realizing what Jesus did for me at the cross and then trusting him to change my life and he's been changing it ever since. Grace Baptist Church, then when we moved to uh, uh, Grace Baptist Church in Murray, Kentucky, as a college student, really battling, struggling to, to find my identity in the world and eventually discovering my identity in Jesus Christ around that time. Through a man, uh, uh, my late mentor, a man by the name of Bob Warren. He's been dead for about a year. Right here in Hardin, Kentucky, and many of y'all maybe know Bob. He refocused me not on chasing after empty religion or chasing after a certain church or chasing after a certain denomination, but chasing the person of Jesus Christ. The Christ in Bob had a part to play in shaping my destiny. For 168 years, there have been people who have been shaping the destinies of other people as Christ lives through them right here in this place. And I'm convinced he's not done. I'm convinced that the Lord uh, wants to give you more open doors of destiny to walk through. Would you stand with me and we'll read our text this morning. It's written to a church, Revelation chapter 3. Beginning with verse 7 as we honor the reading of God's word. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, 
These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it, for you have a little strength. Isn't it good that when we just have a little strength, the Lord can bless us? Just a little. You have kept my word and have not denied my name. Let's pray. Father, it's great to be in your presence, in the presence of one whom is love. In the presence of one who lives in us and through us, for those of us who've trusted you by faith. and Lord, there's so many great things you want to do through us. I'm thankful for this place right here in this area. You've placed this church for 168 years. I pray blessings on this church, on the pastor, that you continue to open doors for the gospel in new and fresh ways, and that you shut the ones that need to be shut. God, we love you and we thank you. Bless these people that are here this morning. They could be anywhere else. They've chosen to be here. So bless them and their families in a special way. And We give this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Through the years, the Lord's done great things here in your body. He's opened. He's been the one to open door after door for you to share the gospel in different ways. And I'm here to tell you that really, there's never been a better day than the time in which we live right now to recognize new doors that God is opening to all of our churches right now. There's never been a better time for the gospel. Never. And homecoming is about celebrating, yes, what the Lord has done. Amen? The Lord's done great things, and so we celebrate that. And those who've gone on before us, homecoming is about that. But I also believe that even more than that, homecoming is about looking forward. Homecoming is about looking at all of the things that God wants to do through us in the future. Homecoming is about looking unto Jesus who's the author and the finisher of the faith and all the doors that he's opening even right now. Notice this fitting text is a letter to a special church. A door is being opened to this church, the church Philadelphia. It means brotherly love and this door is being opened to this church and I want you to know no door opens without the doorkeeper. So let's first see then the keeper of the keys. Who's the keeper of the keys of these doors? If we're going to be churches uh, that want to walk through doors of destiny, people, individuals that walk through doors of destiny, it's important that we know who has the keys of these doors. Amen? Well, we discover here in the text, and especially if we look back at Revelation chapter 1, we discover that it is none other than Jesus Christ Himself. It's our Lord. It isn't empty religion. It isn't, again, denominations. It isn't false religious systems that can open these doors. It isn't clever man somehow discovering a way to walk through doors himself. It isn't a shrewd, wealthy businessman. Uh, It's not wealthy people or, or, or poor people or any kind of certain group of people or any kind of racial group. It's not any political establishment that's able to open these doors. It's only Jesus Christ himself. It's the Son of God. The song said, it's the crucified, the resurrected, the ascended, the living in the church right now, Almighty King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the keeper of the keys of our destinies is Jesus Christ. He alone is the sovereign opener and shutter of the doors of destiny. Notice what Revelation again, chapter 1 says in verse 17, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. Oh, isn't that sweet to know? No matter what's happening right now in your life, in our world, Jesus says, do not be afraid. Boy, it's good to trust in in the one who's the creator of time, isn't it? Who who gives you that, that wonderful, wonderful phrase. Do not be afraid. No matter what you're going through right now. I've got a plan for you. I have a door for you. I'm shutting a door right now. Do not be afraid. Why is that? Why? Because I'm the first and the last, I'm outside time. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen. And I have, notice this, the keys of Hades and of death. Jesus Christ is the keeper of the keys. He's the keeper of the keys of these doors. What does he say? What, do we, what can we glean from the keeper of the, of the keys of these doors of destiny here? It says here, these things says he who is holy. The keeper of the keys is righteous. The keeper of the keys is holy. It means he's set apart. It means there's no one like him. 
And you know what that tells me? That means that any holy behavior that we're going to have, it's going to have to come from His life flowing in and through us. Anything holy that comes out of us is going to have to be the Spirit of God through our lives. And that's really what draws people to the keeper of the keys. Whenever God opens a door, people don't need to see us, they need to see the keeper of the keys. Living in us, His Spirit flowing through the body of Christ. And doors open as He lives through us. He opens doors the more we pursue His very life. Remember, destiny, the textbook definition, is something that flows from power. Well, He is the source of all power. The righteous Holy One is the source of all power. He's the one who has the power to change lives. Not me, not your pastor, not you, not any person on this planet. He alone has the power to change lives, to change hearts. Jesus said this in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, as the life source, you can do nothing. Nothing. So we need to learn to live by his life, the righteous, set-apart life. Not only does it say he is righteous, notice he is holy. He who has the, key of, he who has, uh, the keys is holy, but he is also true. He who is true. So not only is he righteous, but he is right. How'd you like to have been his disciple? He never does anything wrong. He never says anything wrong. You know, I used to really be one of those that liked the sign, God is my co-pilot, or the sticker. But you know what? I don't want God as my co-pilot. That would be the most annoying thing on the planet. If God is in the car, I want him driving. He is right. He is true. Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So if you and I want to know truth, and we want to be right, then we must realize that truth isn't some abstract philosophy, or truth isn't some kind of knowledge about something. Truth is a person. Truth is a person. And if we want to know truth, then we we want to follow and learn then more about Him. Learn more about the keeper of the keys. If we want the doors of destiny to open to us, and the doors that need to be shut to shut, then we need to pursue Him. We need to pursue Him. He cannot lie. He who is true. Nestle, there are a lot of counterfeits in the world. Amen? There are a lot of counterfeits in the world today. But let's recognize together there is only one who is the truth and He alone will satisfy the questioner and the doubter. Jesus alone is the answer to what will come. If He becomes our focus, then the future becomes clear and the doors of destiny are open to us to share the gospel in ways we've never even shared before and, and the doors are shut that maybe we never needed to walk through and to begin with for our safety, for our well-being. Notice this also, the keeper of the keys. He is righteous. He is right because He is true. He who has the key of David. He also provides the resources. Whenever we read that, He holds the key of David. The key of David, that's the key of plenty. Can you say the key of plenty? That's the key of David. How do I know that? That's the key of the royal line. David was promised a a special dynasty. that We call it the Davidic covenant. That he would rule and he would reign. His kingdom would last forever. So in order for David to have an eternal kingdom, there's got to be an eternal one setting on it. Well, it's Jesus. He's the eternal one and he owns everything. He's the eternal King of kings. And here's the great news. That you and I, the Bible says that in Jesus Christ, we have become heirs of the kingdom. How's that for resources? Are you lacking for anything? Has your church for 168 years ever lacked for anything that you didn't pray and get on your knees and seek the one who holds the keys and he didn't provide it? He's the one that provides. He's our provider. He always has. And guess what? He always will. He always will. He provides not only the material resources, but He'll provide the spiritual direction and the spiritual resources we need to open the doors, to to go through those doors for many years to come. Listen to what Corey Tim Boom said. There is no panic in heaven, only plans. Aren't you glad of that? There's no panic in heaven. You know, we may be pushing the panic button right now as we we look at our world system and, and the things that are becoming of it, but there's no panic in heaven, only plans. Only plans. The Lord wants us to pursue Him in those plans. No wonder that before these letters to the churches, uh, it began with the phrase, do not be afraid. That's a great word. 
Well, we've seen the keeper of the keys. That's necessary. But now let's look at this church. Let's look at the people of the doors of destiny. We've seen the keeper of the keys, Jesus Christ. But let's see who the people of these doors are. Don't you want to be some of those people? Boy, I do. Let's look at the people of these doors of destiny. Notice the name of this church alone. The church Philadelphia. It means brotherly love. And it says that Jesus knows their works. I bet he does. He knows your works, Olive. He knows Locust Grove's works. But in order to be people of these doors, I think that it says something, the name of this church, of the first thing that we need to be about. These people were saturated with the love of God. They were saturated with the love of God. Philadelphia itself means brotherly love. This church was brotherly love. How would you like to invite people to that church? Hey, come on out tonight to brotherly love. Come on out tonight and join us at Brotherly Love, or this morning at Brotherly Love. Listen, though, to what I found on your website. Yes, I checked you out. That's, that's, what, a, that's what a pastor will do. That's what a person that researches and is, is, wants to present truth to you will do. Listen to this wonderful phrase here at Olive Baptist. It doesn't matter where you come from or what your past might be. This is a place of new beginnings. Wow. Unconditional love. That's the unconditional love of God, amen? It says it doesn't matter where you've been or, or, or who you are or what you're doing right now. I love you because God loved you first. The unconditional love of God. And listen, we want to love you and let God change your life. We're not in the business of changing lives here. We can't do that. But we want to love you, serve you, share truth, and point you to a person who can change your life. So the church, this church here, Philadelphia, was a demonstration, as is your statement, in practice, in the practice of all of us, of the love of God. If we in our churches today are to celebrate anything on homecoming and to anticipate new doors to us, it's going to be, first of all, us celebrating the love that God has for us, the love that we have for one another, and the love that we have for everybody else on the planet. That's where these doors begin to open. When we realize that it's about God's love for us, our love for each other, and the love that we have for other people. Remember, Jesus said that they'll know you by what? Your love first for one another. Your love for one another. In the Bible, 1 John says that God is love. It's the only place in Scripture where we find the nature of God laid out for us. It doesn't say that He has love to give. It doesn't say that he can be loved sometimes. It says that he is love. His very nature is love. That changes everything. That changes everything. It says that his unbelievable love, and and it was demonstrated actually. The scriptures tell us that that unbelievable love that God has, his nature was demonstrated through a cross. Ultimately through the cross where our Savior was stripped, he was beaten, he was tortured, and he was left to hang on the cross. You might say, why? And many people in the world go, why? Because of love. Because of his love. I did not come to condemn the world, Jesus said, but that through me the world might be saved. Wow, that's a, that's a great, that's better than good news. That's the best news I've ever heard. Good news is an understatement, right? That's the best news. So, oh, His love might flow through us, just like it did here in the church at Philadelphia. Flow through through those of us who have already received His wonderful gift of love, His grace through the cross. And He can open all kinds of doors for this love to be displayed today. Do you believe that? For this kind of service to be shown? For this kind of love to be shown? I believe that's also why we find ourselves today in the predicament that we are in. We are known more in the church for what we boycott and condemn rather than our love. We've made it our business to change people, and that was never our responsibility. That's God's responsibility to change people, to change hearts and lives. What's our responsibility? To love each other and to love other people. That's our responsibility to serve, certainly to share this truth as the doors open to us and watch what God does in people's lives. 
almost every single testimony I've read about a, a Muslim turning to, to Jesus, it's been because someone served that particular Muslim to Christ or loved that particular Muslim to Christ. It was because of the love of God. They were saturated with the love of God, but also not only were they saturated with the love of God, that's their, that's their name, but notice this, I see your works, I've set before you an open door, you have a little strength, that's all it takes with Jesus. Have kept my word. They were saturated with His love, but they were dominated by the Word of God. They were dominated by His Word. Well, what was the Word that God gave to them? Well, again, it's a lot of the things that Jesus said to the disciples before He was going to the cross. His Word is true without any errors. Do you believe that? His Word is true without any errors. In homecoming, if we're going to recognize open doors, if we're going to continue to push forward and see what God is going to do through the church, it's going to be that we're not just casual readers, but we're students of the Word of God. Students of the Word of God. Why is that? Well, because His Word is true. It's without any errors. It reveals the heart of man. But even better than that, it reveals the heart of God. The Word of God reveals the heart of man, but even better than that, it reveals His heart. So we shouldn't read the, the Bible as just an end in itself, but we are reading it to know the God who wrote the book. Whenever it says, you kept my word, I'm convinced Jesus left this statement with the disciples. This is the greatest commandment. That you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then do what? Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the ultimate word. He said all the law and the prophets are all fulfilled in those few, few commands there. Brotherly love, olive, if you want to be saturated with the Word of God, you approach the book with a love for God and a love for other people. Not to use the book as a hammer. A love for God, a love for other people. Let God do the changing. Let God do what He does, only He does. Is it still relevant today as it was then? You better believe it. In fact, I believe we see a lot of the pages in this book unfolding today before our eyes. Have a passion for His Word to know the person. I believe, believe that's, that's wholeheartedly what it means when Jesus says, you've kept my Word. You've kept it. You've looked at it not to, to, to know information, but to see who I am. Jesus Himself even said this to the religious leaders. He says, you search the Scriptures, for in the Word you, find, you think you find eternal life. But it's the Word that reveals who I am. Since you've approached this wrong. You're approaching it to know a bunch of stuff, and it talks about who I am. It's so that you might know me. Well, not only were these people of the doors saturated with His love, dedicated to His Word to know the person, but they were also, notice, they were dedicated to the Savior. You have not denied my name. You have not denied my name. They stood firm, even in the midst of trouble. You know, we really don't know what persecution is. You know, all of the things you hear about the, those that, that, the lives that ISIS is taking and all that, man, that that's really kind of takes you back to the ancient biblical times. This is some of what these brothers and sisters were going through then. We really don't know what persecution is. But they, it says here that they did not deny His name. Oh, may it be our, our goal to never deny His name. As well as, I believe, they clarified who He was. Because they knew Him. Do you know what I believe we can do today? There is a warped view today of who God is and who our Savior is. Amen? There's a really warped view of who God is. Sadly, it's because of a lot of people in the church. So I believe what we do is we carry a message about who Jesus is, who God is, that's one way to not deny His name, is to bring the truth about who He really is. Who is He? Oh, He's better than we ever thought He was. Better than we ever thought He was. Whenever I talk to people today about the Lord, and there are, there are opportunities when I, I, I get to do this, and, and I really like this, I always begin with an apology. That's okay. I always say, I am sorry for the things that have been done in the name of Jesus Christ. 
that have been done to you or throughout all history because there have been some bad things done in the name of Jesus. But let me tell you about who He really is. Don't look at the abuses of the followers. Look at the founder. Look at Jesus Himself. Let me tell you, the Bible says that God is love and He loves you so much. So we have a wonderful opportunity right now to do that. Bring it back to Jesus. That's what homecoming is about. Bringing it all back to Jesus. Bring it back to Jesus. Can you say that with me? Bring it back to Jesus. Bring it back to Jesus. It's not about us. It's about Him. There's no other name like His. It's a name that's been elevated above any other name. Why? Because of His humility. Not because of His domineering uh, judgmental, uh, whatever we, we, this a- idea we have of Jesus, he, His humility is what elevated His name. We need to show more humility in our churches. I don't have it all figured out, y'all. I'll be the first to, to let you know that. I've told my people that. But you know what? I'm going to pursue the one who has everything figured out from the beginning to the end. And trust Him with the doors of destiny. So what are these doors? What door is opening here? What doors does the Lord open for us? What are the doors of destiny? Well, they're doors of greatness. They're great, great doors. They're greatness doors. (laughs) They're better than, than good. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9. He says, For a great door and effectual is open to me, though there are adversaries on many sides. Paul says to the church at Corinth, and man, they were in a mess, y'all. This church was, was just the baby believers. They were in a mess, and Paul was ever so patient and loved them and served them. And he says, a great door has opened for the gospel. Here, Corinth. I know you think, and I know what all the other people are saying about you, that you guys are a mess, but I'm telling you that a great door is opening, but there are adversaries. Y'all believe that? There are adversaries to the gospel. There are adversaries to the church. Well, there certainly are. But there are great doors opening right here to the church of Philadelphia in this text. There are great doors that are opening to you, Olive. There are great doors that are opening to our churches, I believe, right now. Because now is a wonderful time. Do you believe that? Wonderful time to share the gospel. And for 168 years, he's been out here opening these great doors for you. And he wants to do that individually in your lives and then collectively as a faith family. And don't just settle for the good when God wants to open something great. In fact, really just understanding who you are in Jesus Christ, that you have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Him, that is a great word right there. That's great news. What's the first door? Well, the door of greatness is believing who He is, what He's done for you, receiving the free gift of His life. Maybe you're here and you've never embraced that first door. You've heard a lot about Him, but you've never seen the cross and and seen your need and embraced that door and walked through that door for yourself and said, I want to know you. I want you to control my life. That's the first door. He died so that you might live in a greater way. Dare I say it, in a Baptist church, in a supernatural way. He died so that we might live in a supernatural way. Don't forget, though, any great doors that open, there are adversaries. There are those who will tell you you don't have to follow him or believe him in order to succeed in life. And though that may be true, I I wonder where the power for your success is coming from. And that can be a dangerous thing. There are those who will tell you, why would you trust this kind of Savior? Those are adversaries. It's that word, the counterfeits. And none of those counterfeits will ever suffice. What's that second door? Well, that second door of greatness, I believe, is the one that's open to this church here. It's, it can be open to a, a lot of churches. And it's, it's living by His life, moment by moment, learning about the empowerment of Christ in you and serving and loving together no matter what it is He gives you the opportunity to do. Whether it's through the Operation Christmas Child, which is a wonderful ministry, or, or however it is that God opens those doors. Whether it's through a field of corn in Murray, Kentucky. God opens doors for you to be able to plug in together and see God serve and love people through your body collectively as a faith family. 
And he'll open those doors, door after door after door. What's the third door? And I'm going to close. Look at Revelation chapter 4. This door of greatness is a heavenly door. It's a heavenly door. Notice this. After these things, after what things? After this, these letters to these churches. I looked up and behold a door standing open in heaven. This door of greatness is a heavenly door. It's a door to glory. A door to glory. For 168 years, people have been living in light of that door out here. They've been living in light of eternity. Living in light of glory. It causes us to live differently right now whenever we live in light of glory. Did you know what Paul said? He said that it's Christ in you all, the hope of glory. So right now, while we're alive, the glory of God is, can shine through the church until we see the glorious God face to face one day. It causes us to live differently. And many in your church have gone on to glory. And many of y'all, we go around this room and, and you can remember things that they've taught you and things that the Lord used in their lives to begin unlocking the doors of destiny in your life, the plans that God has for you. And many of them have gone on to be with the, the Lord, but they left a heritage, a foundation of faithfulness to Jesus Christ. May that be our goal while we're here to leave a foundation of faithfulness to Christ as we continue to live in light of the door to glory. The door to glory. That's an opportunity that's open to us as we continue to follow their example. Many of the examples that people have left about pursuing His heart. As we follow that example of the love and grace of Jesus Christ, then we too can leave that wonderful foundation of faithfulness. To Jesus. Would you bow your heads with me for a while? Maybe you're here this morning and again, you have never walked through that first door. The invitation is open. Jesus says, come. All you, come. Find rest. What's he mean by that? Well, it means that he can live through us. It's no longer our fleshed out responsibility, but it's the Christ in us changing us and leading us and living through us. And you've never embraced the cross of Jesus Christ. It was for you. Come through that first door. Let homecoming mean so much more to you than just a, a, a time of, of seeing people and eating good food. Let it be the start of a wonderful relationship with the one who's outside of time. All of you in the church, all of us in the church can come and to pray. God, you lead us through open doors. God, we want to more than ever today be a people who are saturated with your love. If you want to come and you want to pray at the altar, you can do that. It's a great time to do that. Homecoming is, yes, looking and celebrating the, the past, but also anticipating the doors of destiny as we pursue the heart of one who is loved. Maybe you know someone. God's put them on your heart. You want to come and pray for that person. You can do that. Maybe you just want to go across the aisle and you can, as you look around and you know there are people in this room who have been instrumental in God's plan for your life and you want to say, thank you, I love you. Thank you for, for sharing that with me. Thank you for being my teacher. Thank you for being a mentor. Thank you. Homecoming is a great time to do that. It's a great time to encourage our brothers and sisters in the Lord. It's what we're about, building each other up, equipping each other, edifying each other. Father, thank you so much as the pastor comes. God, uh, I want to just give this time to you. Uh, this time has been for you. Lord, we want you to, to move in, in hearts and lives right now. This don't, we don't want the, the time to end right now. We know there are people in here that... that that need to come to the altar to pray, people that need to, to maybe go across the aisle, hug some necks and say thank you for being instrumental in, in God's plan for my life. 
Maybe they want to come and, and thank their pastor. Say, Pastor, thank you for being instrumental in God's plan for my life. I want to pray with you. I want to pray for you. I want to let you know how much I appreciate you. Father, maybe there's someone in here that wants to come and receive your life. I've heard the gospel before, and, and, and Father, I, I want to know you. I want to begin a relationship with you. I want you to be the keeper of my destiny. I want you to lead me. I'll let the Spirit speak to your heart. Let Him lead you. As we sing, as your pastor's here, let God do His work. Trust the Spirit of God. so glad that you took time out of your schedule and your week and prepared a message especially for Olive, Olive Baptist. I pray it resides in your heart and it resonates there and it grows and it blooms from, from here on. And you do know that he first loved us. And if there is somebody out there this morning that, that has not gone through that first door of experiencing his love, that the only time it's too late, do not put it off, but the only time it's too late is when you've taken your last breath. He's calling. He's knocking on your door. And you're wondering right now, I thought we were going to go eat. What do we do now? We go eat. This is what we do. Baptists, they get together, they have friends over, and they go eat. And there's probably some fried chicken, and there's probably some uh, potato salad and, and good stuff and desserts like that. And you're just wondering, what's, what's taking place right now? Well, I told you, we're going to... I was sitting out there listening to Riker. I'm thinking, man, I just I want to be up there. I want to be up there in that pulpit. i got a word to share. And if somebody, I'm going to have to take it home and let Brenna hear it or something like that and, and just wear the kids out over it. They hear enough of me, and they don't, they don't appreciate it anyway. I think Michaela, she usually just shuts the door and gets on her device, and that way she doesn't have to listen to what I have to say. But I really, well, I'm really missing the opportunity of not getting up here and sharing with you. But uh, don't worry, I don't have a message for you. But, uh, but we do, we, we, we really do. We come together this morning to celebrate 168 years, to celebrate uh, the heritage of, of all. We, we want to celebrate the people that have had the forefathers of the church that have gone on before us, the, the ones that have, uh, have laid the groundwork. I, I know you, I, mean, I, don't, I really don't know enough history about the church uh, you guys know a lot better than I do, but I, I know you've had building programs in the past. You've moved from, from one location or one facility. You've, you've uh, added on. You've tore down. You, you picked up a house, didn't you, and moved it. Isn't that right? You picked up the parsonage and moved it just up the street. So you are innovators. You really are. Even out here in Olive, Olive the community of Olive, you are uh, people that are, that are doing things to bring more in. You really want to see more people come in. Well, we've been on a project for the last, the last year or so. We have been in a project of, of renovating the Sunday school wing, the educational uh, department, the downstairs uh, facility as well. And, and I don't know if we can put a bow on it and say it's 100% 100, it's 100 done. We're not coming back over here to, dry, to do anything else. I'm looking over there at Paul and Jimmy and see if I get the A-OK or if it's just 99%. There's always something to do, isn't there? All right. Well, anyway, uh, we do want you to, to walk through the facility, the, uh, the, the education area. Uh, you can make your way through the hallway right there. It leads. The last room on your left is the nursery. 
Uh, you can go through the nursery. There is some stairs that take you downstairs. If you're physically able to go downstairs from there, and it will wind you back up to the door to walk over to the Family Life Center for, for lunch. Um, but if you, if you can't make it downstairs, there's a ramp over here. You can walk downstairs that way. Just use the ramp, or you can walk, walk through, especially our guests. If you're a guest here, maybe you used to go to church here, we really want you to go and see. I think you're going to be uh, pleased. I think you're going to be glad. I think you're going to be proud of the church that you used to once call home. And if you're serving somewhere else, that's great. Hey, we're all one family, okay? We're, we're all of the same shepherd. We have one shepherd that we listen to. We're just glad you're here this morning. You take pride. This probably is, if somebody had to ask you what's your home church, you would probably deep down inside say, Olive Baptist is. My membership, I may not attend there right now, but that's my home church. It really is. It's where I grew up. Walk through there. See what they've done. I think you'll be excited for them and what what's taking place in their life. And I want to read one verse to you. I'm not going to take but just a couple of minutes. Psalm 122, verse 1. I was glad. This is David speaking right here. Psalm was written by David, possibly after the ark had been uh, removed, taken to Jerusalem, and he wanted to build a temple, temple of God, the temple for, for God, for his, his, uh, his presence, the ark to reside in. He wasn't the one to do it, but Solomon was. David intended this psalm to encourage the tribes of Israel, for the church, for the temple, uh, to be the center of that that nation. And that's what we desire for, for all of that. We want this to be the center of the family. We want this to be the center of the community. We want you to, just as David writes here, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Do you go through the week waiting, just longing for, for your spirit to intersect the spirit of God, the presence of God in the church on Sunday morning when we gather together as believers? Do you long for that in your being? David is saying that, man, I was glad when I woke up and the alarm clock went off and it was Sunday because I knew that I was going to be with my brothers and sisters in Christ and I want to be there with them. That's what David is saying. So as we dedicate this area over here, you know, the temple was the place that God promised. I promise this, this is my presence. My presence will ever be before you. It will be with you. And matter of fact, the Shekinah glory, if you're familiar with that, that came down upon the tabernacle, upon the temple for a time. The Shekinah of glory, the presence of God rested there. And that's what I want to call out for today. God, that your presence would rest upon that as the people over here, as the teachers prepare to bring the word, as the teachers prepare to, to, to bring what you have poured out to them during the week. That that Shekinah glory of God, that the presence of the glory of God, we hold uh, an aspect of God's glory. God, David says, I was glad when they said to, that we could go to the house of the Lord. We hold something very valuable in our hands. We hold the actual very breath of God in our hands, directly from him. You don't, have to, you don't have to go to a palm reader. You don't have to go to somebody that reads cards or stay up late at night and, and wait for somebody to give you some kind of hint on how to live your life. God himself has already given you the instruction. So that's my prayer. My prayer is that the educational uh, wing be used for instruction for daily life. That the teachers, the assistants, the people that clean up after us when we're over there, Whenever Bible school is used over there, uh, whenever anything is used over there, that the teaching of God uh, be prominent and that we eagerly look for Sunday because people have prepared to bring the word of God. So that's my, that's my prayer for that. I want to encourage you to walk through there. There's plenty of food over there. Walk through there. If you can make it down the stairs, wind your way back up. If not, you can take the ramp down and look at it. And uh, just remember, remember what it was, remember what, see what it is today, and just think about what door God is going to open up for us to be tomorrow. Let me pray for you. Father, I pray that your glory will be seen. I pray that rest will be felt. I pray that acceptance will be found. I pray that love will be poured out 
even in those four corners of those walls over there. Many rooms, each one uh, maybe touches a, a ladies' class, a, a mixed class, a, a young adult class, a, a misplaced class, a class that doesn't seem to fit any other where. They, they just meet. So, Lord, whether we're drinking a, a cup of coffee together, we're eating a donut or whatever it is that, that we're doing together, may we know that your word, your presence, that your Shekinah glory has resided upon this place, that your spirit has found home here, and there is a sweet spirit among the believers. So, Lord, we ask you to fill every room. We ask you to anoint the teachers uh, that when they prepare... Your word would be a blessing to the receiver. Father, that these words would come from you. No matter who, who they're teaching, no matter who they're reaching, moms, dads, singles, seniors. Father, if we fill the rooms up, we give you glory for that. If we have to tear down another wall to make a, a, a larger room to accommodate a, a class, Father, we'll do that. We uh, praise you for that. And Lord, as classes split and then multiply and grow and, and birth new classes, Lord, we give you glory for that. So, Father, we dedicate the renovation, the, the, the work that you have compelled people to do, not for our glory, not that I would receive a pat on the back for uh, for anything I've done or that anybody else that picked up a paintbrush or a, a hammer or a saw, they don't want any glory out of this, Father, but all glory be to you in all things. So, Father, it's yours. Use it as you desire. Fill it, Lord. May we be a vessel, a tool for you. May it be a tool. In Jesus' name, we are so thankful for all you have done for us. It's only because of his power. And we give it back to you. So Lord, as we move from here, as we move from here to looking at what has taken place, and Father, as we move next door, I pray a blessing upon that food as well, that it be nourishment for our physical body. Father, you have fed our spiritual body so much already today. But Lord, as we move that you would bless the food. And Father, we love you for all you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. So whether you're viewing the rooms or if you're going next door to go ahead and eat, help yourself. Glad you're here this morning.